All right, why don't we get started? I almost forgot to hit the start button, but luckily Emily's here to, uh, to tell me to do that. She's giving me a very mean look, but anyway, let's get started. We're going to talk more about ETFs today. So we did do a session on Tuesday evening, Sydney time on ETFs. So if anyone missed that, let me know. I can point you in the right direction for the YouTube recording. And we'll, of course, record this one, get that up on YouTube as well. So before we get started, our housekeeping item. So number one, anything you hear today is, of course, general advice. I don't know anything about you, so I can't offer personal advice. If you're over in New Zealand, you can get a copy of our uh, VAP on our website, morningstar.com.au, and the New Zealand regulatory authorities would, of course, encourage you to speak to a financial advisor if you want personal advice. So we are going to take a little bit more of a deep dive today on ETFs. We're talk about some ETFs that maybe you should be a little careful about. Um, so we'll touch on my favorite thematics. We'll talk a little bit about some of the ESG-related ETFs as well and things to look out for there. But let's just get started. Okay, well, it's Valentine's Day, apparently. So we have a Valentine's theme with little Cupid firing his arrow into, uh, into a chart. But the love affair, as I've termed it, with ETFs continues to grow in Australia. So you can see two different things here. Number one, the bar chart. You, of course, can see the total assets that are in ETFs. And then of course, with our little line chart across the top, you can see the number of ETFs in Australia. So we have moved above 240, which I think is safe to say probably more ETFs than anyone needs. But this can of course bring a lot of confusion. So as we have more and more choices, investors can number one, get paralyzed by that choice. And number two, of course, do what we always tell you not to do, and that is constantly switch around to the next new bright, shiny ETF that comes out there, which can lead to problems because often that is chasing performance, which for long-term investors, for any investors, isn't a great strategy. So let's get into a couple of the details about the most popular ETFs in Australia. So you can see a chart here showing the assets showing a three-year annualized performance on them, and of course, showing the Morningstar rating if we rate those ETFs. So I think the good news is, looking at all of these, the majority of the ETFs that are on here are tracking large, broad-based indexes, um, which is certainly... I think what many people think about ETS, many people feel like they are generally passive products, even though they don't have to be, and generally a cheap and easy way to get exposure to one of those broad-based indexes. A couple of things to point out, the number two ETF on here, this Magellan Global Fund, is one of those active ETFs I've talked about. So ETFs, of course, come in both passive and active variety, so active where somebody's out there picking individual shares for it. The other one that I think is a little bit interesting that some people don't know about is the second to last one, this Beta Shares Australian High Interest Cash ETF, triple A. So there are cash ETFs that are available as well. Um, just obviously make sure that you understand what you are getting when you are purchasing a cash ETF. You can see that three-year return. Obviously, interest rates over three years have been very low, as I'm sure everyone is aware, starting to go up now where there's an opportunity to get a little more yield on those. But just remember that, uh, of course, paying transaction fees and other things for a cash ETF can be a problem if that return is not very high. So we're going to spend some time at a future webinar, I believe in two weeks, digging into some of the most popular ETFs. But the reassuring thing to me on here is, of course, as I said before, that a lot of these are not some of the thematic ETFs, which can cause problems for investors, um, that mostly people are using them I would say appropriately, and you can see some of the Morningstar ratings on here as well, um, that the vast majority, eight out of the 10, have received 
a medalist rating from our analysts. So that is gold, silver, and bronze. Those are ETFs that we believe are good opportunities for investors. A couple of neutrals on there, including that second one, Magellan. So Magellan did start the year, the year 2022, as the largest ETF in Australia, but has suffered a lot of outflows along with a lot of other Magellan funds based on a pretty poor short-term track record in terms of performance. So those are the most popular ETFs. As I said, we'll get more into those later. But we want to talk about some ETFs that potentially investors should avoid. And we're going to talk about one of the things that I talk about all the time, which is thematic ETF. So we'll talk a little bit about what this means and what they are. But as you can see, there are currently approximately 20 thematic ETFs in Australia. They've attracted in totality a little over $4 billion. Now, let's start with the definition of thematic ETFs. There is no actual definition of a thematic ETF, of course, but the way that I like to describe them, that's why we have approximate numbers for the number of them. But the way that I like to describe them is they are trying to take advantage of a specific theme that is popular with investors, a narrative that's popular with investors, and trying to capitalize on really the fact that most people believe that this is a potentially attractive investment. Now, globally, you can see there are a lot more thematic ETFs, over 475 of them, which is a large increase from last year, holding $348 billion in assets. A lot of that is in the US. And I will say that thematic ETFs, the US ETF market is much larger in terms of of course, the total money invested, but also the number of products available. And a lot of those um, thematic ETFs are in the US. Um, so yeah, something that maybe is just foreshadowing what we're going to see in Australia. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in a second. Uh, I listed just some of the popular thematic ETFs that are out there. Uh, of course, I'd be happy to go through any of those in detail if people are interested, but those are all of them. And you can see they typically come with some sort of um, some sort of ticker symbol that indicates what they're actually investing in. But you can see a number of them on there should be obvious for uh, for some of them. Um, so hack, cybersecurity, robo, robotics, ATDC, battery tech, et cetera, et cetera. And one thing to know about thematic ETFs and why they don't really fit what many investors think about ETFs is, number one, they are typically not cheap. So we have a statistic from StockSpot on there showing that the amount that you pay in an annual fee for a thematic ETF is seven times what those broad-based ETFs that we're advocates for at Morningstar charge. Um, so you are paying a lot more. They typically are sold as a type of passive or index tracking product. But what they're really doing is they're tracking an index that has been created through back testing and really just put together simply to sell these products. Um, so these are very narrowly focused indexes. Some of the indexes, particularly around FANG, for example, are basically um, just active stock picking. There's a committee that picks what shares go into that index, for example, um, which really doesn't meet our definition of passive investing. So I think a lot of investors can be confused um, that they are tracking these indexes, um, but they are typically not passive investments. They have been created to capture that theme and um, don't really meet the definition of what we would call an index. And this last point, as I said, you know, we've seen this explosion in the US of thematic ETFs. I think it's likely that Australia will continue to follow. And you have to think about the fact that, of course, ETFs are created and marketed by companies. Those companies are obviously looking for inflows. And one of the problems of the ETF universe, and especially as it continues to expand and there's more and more products that are being listed, is that 
very early on, a lot of the major indexes, of course, were taken with ETFs. So whether that's looking at something domestically where we're tracking the ASX 200 or 300, or some of the global indexes, whether that's one of the BISPI developed market indexes, whether it's the S&P 500 in the US, that space is really taken up already. And many of the fees on those are very, very low. So where a lot of these new ETF um, offerings are created, of course, is things like thematics, things like um, ESG indexes, which we'll talk about as well today. But that's really where companies are out there targeting new inflows from, uh, from ETF investors. Um, yeah, so Paul's got a good question. So he's saying, are ethical and sustainable exchange-traded products considered to be thematic? They don't meet the definition. Once again, there's not an official definition. They don't really meet, I guess, my definition of thematic ETS, but I think there's some things that investors need to look out for. And a lot of the things, and we're going to talk about this a little bit later, but a lot of the things that are really driving this product creation around thematics is also happening in the ESG space. So the fees are higher. Um, they are products where maybe that product landscape is built out as much and there are opportunities for companies to go in there and create new ETFs. So it's a really good question, Paul. We'll talk about that in a second. Um, and so is the performance net of trading costs? It is not. So one of the things about trading costs, um, it's another question from Paul. One of the things about trading costs, of course, they're, they're highly personal. Um, so it depends upon basically the two costs of trading an ETF. Number one, the outright cost of going in whatever you pay your broker to execute a trade in ETF, and that can vary significantly among brokers. And last week we did talk around, we used ComSec as an example, that for many ComSec customers, they're paying $19.95 for a trade. So I can't include that in those overall performance figures because of course you could have 20 different trades in order to establish a position. And that also counts for that bid-ask spread or that buy-sell spread um, that you pay as well. So it is a very personal thing. So once again, we did talk about this last week, but you know, one of the problems with ETFs, of course, is because they are easy to trade and easy to access, people tend to do it more, which is not necessarily a good thing. What it does, what those performance figures do include is they include management fees. Right. So when I'm sitting here and I'm talking about um, the average fee for a thematic ETF is 0.77%. That, of course, is the management fee that's being charged. So those will be taken out before those performance figures. Um, so that's the difference of looking at the performance of an ETF versus looking at what the underlying performance of the index is. So if we think about an index, and once again, this is not talking about trading costs, but if we think about an index, that index return is pure, right? So somebody tells you what the ASX 200 index has done, that does not include any costs. Of course, right off the bat, anytime we're talking about an investment product, we need to take those fees away. But I just went in and looked at the underlying ETF performance, and that will be adjusted for those fees. Um, so that was a, uh, so that was a good question. We've got a couple more, so we might as well, uh, might as well go into them. Okay. So Graham, um, Graham's got a question. What's the benefit of an ETF compared to a listed investment company such as Argo? Well, let's talk about the differences a little bit. And, you know, the benefit of course is all in the eye of the beholder, right? So it's, it's up to you, but there's a difference between the two of them. So a listed invest, investment company, a LIC, also trades on an exchange, just like an ETF. So once again, they're easy to access because you can access them directly through your brokerage, as opposed to a managed fund, which can be a little trickier. Um, you either need to go through a platform this is in Australia, of course, you either know, go through a platform, um, many of which advisors are on, but you can also get on a platform yourself, or you have to invest directly with that fund company that's issuing that fund. So they both trade on an exchange, but the difference between an ETF and a LIC is that a LIC has no mechanism in place to keep 
the price of that wick close to the net asset value which basically just means what is the value of the assets that are held in that wick. So a very, very simple example is let's say you had a lick that held one share that was $100. So the net asset value of that lick would be $100. But the price of the lick on the exchange would be driven by buyers and sellers, basically. So at the end of the day, if you have a lot more buyers, the price would go up. If you had a lot more sellers, the price would go down. So it's driven the same way a share price would be driven, right? So it's kind of those supply and demand forces that are going to drive the price. And so what you see with a lot of licks is you can see very large discounts or very large premiums between what the assets are in the lick and what um, somebody's actually going to sell it to you for on an exchange. Now, some investors can be, this cannot bother them at all. Some investors, it does bother them. A lot of companies that issue licks have problems with this if their lick continually is a very, very, um, has a very, very large discount to that net asset value. And some licks are actually converting into ETFs. So ETFs don't have that problem. What an ETF has is it has a mechanism in place that keeps that net asset value and the price of the ETF pretty close together. So one of the challenges with investing in LICs is, number one, there's a manager that's out there doing it. Now, LICs are actively managed products. So that means there is a manager or managers making decisions on what to buy and sell in that LIC. But one of the things you have to contend with is your return will not only be impacted by how that manager does, but your return will also be impacted by changes in that discount or premium. So as those evolve over time, and they certainly can evolve over time, that's going to impact your returns as well. The one other thing around a lick that's important to understand is the legal structure is different. So, and that legal structure really has to do with the way that dividends and capital gains are paid out to you as an investor in a lick. So an ETF or a fund is what we call a pass-through vehicle. That means during a period of time, so generally they pay semi-annually, some quarterly, um, over that period of time, any dividends that are received on those underlying holdings and any capital gains that are generated so if they're selling something within that portfolio for more than they bought it for, that's a capital gain. That is, there's a tax impact on that. All of those are passed directly through to you as an investor. So that's why they are a pass-through entity. And we'll talk a bit, little bit about a little more about some of the challenges that you have around ETFs and investing in ETFs for income because of that. And the biggest challenge is that um, the biggest challenge is that, you know, of course, you don't necessarily know how much of that distribution that's paid for you, how much of that is a dividend versus how much of that is um, a capital gains distribution. So going back and looking at what an ETF paid in a previous period is not necessarily indicative of what it's going to pay going forward. And I actually just saw a post on this on Instagram right before I came in here um, that the equity mates put up something saying these are the five highest yielding ETFs in Australia. And if you go in there and look at what some of those are, a lot of them are not reflective of what the strategy is. So there was a oils futures ETF, right? That probably generated a lot of capital gains last year because as those future contracts roll, of course, they're selling them and replacing them. They're distributing those capital gains. We would not see any of that. We would not see any of that income come if oil was actually falling. Um, so that's an example of how investors can get a little bit trapped with, uh, with ETFs, the advantage that a lick has, and one of the reasons licks are very popular with retirees and very popular with retirees looking for income, the advantage is a lick can choose when to distribute those capital gains taxes and, um, and those dividends. And what they do is they use that to smooth it out. So people that are looking for consistent income, they'll often gravitate towards a lick, where with an ETF, 
you're not going to get that. You can see them bouncing around depending upon how markets go. Uh, okay, so we've got another question. So Lisa's got a question on, uh, does capital gains tax apply every year at ETFs as opposed to only when I sell my individual stocks? They can. So they can apply every year. The question is, does that portfolio that's held within the ETF, does that generate capital gains? So certainly, as long as capital gains are generated, they will be passed on to you. So you do not get to choose when you take capital gains as you can if you're an investor in individual shares. Um, so what that allows you to do if you're in individual shares, it allows you to smooth out those capital gains, potentially allows you to offset them with losses. Um, so it depends upon the ETF. And when we get into some of the thematic ETFs that we'll talk about, we'll talk about, you know, typically it's rebalancing, it's changing that portfolio, or if there's an active manager changing that portfolio, that's when you get capital gains. On some of these broad base index ETFs, you're not going to see as much because you're basically those indexes won't change as much. They certainly can, right? So if the ASX 200 is the 200 largest shares, you can get capital gains. If the 200th largest share gets replaced by the 201st that grows larger than that, you can see capital gains. But those are very minor parts of the portfolio because a lot of them are market cap weighted, meaning more money goes into the largest shares. Hopefully that answers your question. All right, we'll keep moving. I'll get back to some of the other questions that have come up. But let's keep talking about thematic ETFs and one of the challenges of thematic ETFs. So as I said, investors should approach these with caution. They typically do very well initially when they come out and then you can see that performance fall off. Historically, that's happened. But we need to think about investing based on a theme and what it actually entails. And basically for a thematic ETF to be successful, really three different conditions need to be met. So the first thing is you need to pick a winning theme, right? So the idea behind a thematic ETF is something like climate change, a weighted battery technology or cybersecurity, something that's been in the headlines a lot, something that you've seen a lot in the paper that businesses are spending on and it's a focus of businesses or consumers. Really, that's what is wrapped into these ETFs, right? This sort of common theme that most people believe, that's conventional wisdom, that most people believe will be an area of growth. But we have to remember that, and we have a hard time doing this as humans, but even going back and looking at different themes and different things that were going to, quote unquote, change the world, be a great investment opportunity, a lot of them don't actually play out. And all sorts of things can happen. You know, number one, obviously, there can be technological advancements that can, uh, that can throw off this theme. Um, there can be shifts in sort of global focus and priorities. And I thought a good one to look back on um, a little bit is, of course, uh, oil. So oil is an interesting one. You know, if we go back a couple of decades, we start hearing about peak oil. We started hearing about, particularly in the U.S., but a lot of other countries as well, without domestic supplies, you know, where oil came from, primarily the Middle East, there's geopolitical instability. Um, the oil prices would keep going up and going up and going up and going up. And then once again, we had, in this case, kind of an old technology that got adopted, it was fracking or coal seam oil, um, as we call it in, in Australia. And that, of course, drove the prices down significantly. For a while, the U.S. became the world's top oil producer. And then, of course, we went through the whole COVID thing where a lot of that fracking went away because prices were so low. But, you know, we see these themes that everyone believes is actually happening, but there can be something that can throw off the balance, throw off, um, throw off a theme. So just remember, even things that you're sitting there saying are almost near certainties um, to be a good theme that can change. Second thing, of course, that you need to do is you need to pick this winning theme, then you have to find an ETF that will allow you to capture that. And one of the tricky things about that, and particularly around new technology, and this is where we see a lot of these themes, whether it's technology, whether it's healthcare, some sort of emerging, um, some sort of emerging market, right? Not 
from a country standpoint, but some sort of new thing that is uh, that's expected to be really popular, you have to pick an ETF that can profit from that theme. And one of the hard things around this new technology that gets developed is that we don't necessarily know what the ultimate beneficiary of that theme is. And it could be lots of different people. It could be the companies that are producing that technology. It can be other companies that use that technology as a business model, or it could be consumers. Sometimes, of course, and particularly in these very popular themes where you see a lot of investment into them, we can have huge oversupply issues. And the oversupply issues can, of course, drive down prices, which might benefit us as a consumer. They can drive down prices where new businesses that we never even dreamed of existing come into uh, come into play. And there's a couple different examples. I use two different examples um, from very different time periods. But I wrote an article on lithium shares, I don't know, a couple of weeks ago, and was looking back on my early days of investing during the dot com bubble. And the thing that we always heard about there is we said, what is this new technology? This new technology is the internet, right? The internet is going to change everything. And a lot of people, myself included, thought, okay, well, if the internet's going to be really big. We need a lot of broadband, right? So we need to build these broadband networks. We need this capacity in order to power the internet. And there's two main companies that were sort of associated with that, one called WorldCom, one called Global Crossing, who for a while were investor darlings, really using that sort of first order thinking, internet will be big, we need capacity in order to handle the internet. And both actually went out of business. And one of the things they did is because all this investor money was flowing into this space, they just built and built and built and built. And it got to the point where I believe it was around 2001, 2002, their estimates are only 5% of this global broadband network that they had created were actually being utilized. So what, of course, happens when there is a ton of capacity that far outstrips demand? Well, prices fall significantly. So these companies that built these networks, of course, went out of business. Now, who was the beneficiary of this? Well, the beneficiary of this was all of the companies that found it. Okay, now that we have very cheap broadband, now that we have a lot of the world connected and a lot of households able to access this really cheaply, what can we deliver over these huge networks? So whether that's a company like YouTube before uh, it was purchased by Google or Alphabet. Um, well, let's start delivering video and tons of video content over that, whether that's even some of the streaming services now, things like that, they were the beneficiaries, not the actual companies that were creating the networks. And in many ways, we were the beneficiaries also as consumers as we saw internet access, the cost of internet access, and how much we could actually consume over the internet grow and grow and grow for very, very cheap. So we just have to be careful also that with any of these emerging technologies, we don't exactly know where the benefit and who the beneficiary is going to come going to be. So something also important to think about. So that was my modern example. So go back my very old example um, is railroads. Railroads were really similar, right? So railroads, of course, were this revolutionary technology at the time. So instead of riding your horse around, you could jump on a train a little bit easier. And we saw huge gluts in both the UK and the US around railroads, where once again, all this investor capital was chasing this new technology and people just built railroads everywhere. They built them next to each other. All this track was laid and what ended up happening is these companies went into a lot of debt, of course, to build out these huge rail networks. So what happened? Well, they started competing with each other and prices plummeted. And so the actual beneficiaries of a lot of this were people that were shipping things over the railroads and who benefited from those really cheap prices. So like an example is the old Sears Roebuck catalog in the US or all of a sudden some farmer out in the Midwest was ordering something from Chicago and it was delivered very cheaply over the railroads or cheaply for the time. We also, of course, saw 
other companies like Standard Oil is a pretty, uh, pretty famous one. And I was like, okay, well, all of a sudden now we can start going and drilling for oil in Pennsylvania and ship it all over the place because railroads are really cheap. So it's another example of the technology, much like the internet, that revolutionized the world, but didn't turn out to be a great investment opportunity. And the beneficiaries were actually other parties. So just something to think about. And, you know, that's sort of a wider level. And then kind of on a more narrow level is really examining how that ETF, what are the companies in that ETF? How does it actually capture um, this supposed new technology theme? And I've done these before and talked about ACDC, which is the, uh, the one that's based on battery technology. And you know, lithium as well as an ingredient in that. And go in and look at some of the companies in there. And you'll see that some of the companies are these giant companies that don't get that much of their revenue. And Samsung is kind of a famous one that they, of course, do invest largely and sell battery technology. But if you're Samsung, you're getting a lot of your revenue from other places. Um, so having those companies in the ETF is not necessarily a pure play on what you think you're getting which of course is, is battery technology. So it's important to go in and look at the companies and how these kind of bastardized indexes are created um, and what they're, what they're actually capturing. Um, so something else that's important to, uh, to look at. And then the final point, which I think potentially is one of the most important ones, is just remember how these themes come about. They generally come about when something is as I said, sort of conventional wisdom that this theme is going to be a huge investment opportunity. And if you think about, you know, how an ETF gets created, well, you know, what they're trying to do, and many of these are sort of marketing conventions, they want to play into the fact that it's widely accepted. If you are one of the early investors in some new technology, well, it's not widely accepted yet. So they're not going to create an ETF until sort of the populace as a whole understands this investment opportunity until that narrative becomes very, very compelling to a large amount of investors. And any time we invest, we need to understand that certain assumptions are priced into those underlying shares. And those are assumptions about the future. Now, those assumptions, of course, about the future could be very, very negative, which is when we see very low share prices. But for all these thematic ETFs, they're generally very, very positive. And so even if you tick both of those first two boxes, you can find that a lot of that future potential is already priced in, and particularly if there's a lot of hype around this theme that you're investing in, not only is that priced in, but maybe a far more optimistic future than what is possible was priced into those. And certainly if you go back to that WorldCom Global Crossing example that I was talking about, that was the case, right? These companies were not trying to build a network that was only 5% utilized in the early 2000s. What they were trying to do, what they had in their heads and what investors had in their heads that funded this, including young Mark was this incredibly optimistic view of the future that never played out, despite the fact that the internet has obviously changed the way that we do everything. And that can be an issue as well. So if something is priced in, then of course, it is too late for you to take advantage of that. So you are not one of these early investors that's catching this up swing. And we always hear about this stuff, right? We always hear about, we go back and we look at some of the shares that perform very well historically, you know, they've had some hiccups lately, whether that's Meta, which is Facebook, or whether it's Alphabet, which is Google. We always hear about these early investors and how much they made. Well, just be a little bit careful because obviously they're investing with a lot of risk at that time. But if you are very late to the party, of course, those high valuation levels will detract from future returns and can lead to disaster if they never live up to this potential that a lot of investors have. So three things to think about when you're going out there and picking a thematic ETF, maybe just go through that checklist, start to think about where we are on each one of these, right? What are the probabilities that this theme will actually play out? What 
does that ETF, does that ETF capture the theme? Do we know where the profits are going to flow from this new technology? Is it going to be the creators of the technology or is it going to be somewhere else? And then, of course, how much and what is priced into this new technology? Um, so three important things to think about. So that a couple more questions. I'll pause for um a second. So Joseph has a question getting back to dividends. Everyone does love dividends. Um, do some ETFs pay dividends quarterly, if done frank to frank dividends, and with dividend reinvestment plans? Most, um, most ETFs do pay out dividends semi-annually. Um, so you see more quarterly in the U.S., but there are certainly some quarterly ones as well. Um, dividend reinvestment plans depends on your broker. Um, but, you know, I, I get dividend reinvestment plans on, uh, on ETFs, so you can, uh, can do it. And then in terms of the unfranked versus franked, yeah, it just depends what, they're, depends what they are investing in. Um, so if you are a person in ETF that has local shares in it, then, of course, you do get those franking. Um, Credits. All right. So we've got a question from Paul saying, what is an indicator that this potential has been priced in? Well, I would look at overall valuation levels. So when we talk about priced in and when you talk about future growth, what we're really looking at there is we're looking at what is an investor um, paying for sort of current earnings. If they're paying a lot for current earnings, you know they're not paying for current earnings, right? So that's why we want to look at valuation levels. Generally, the higher the valuation level, then the rosier the uh, future is priced in. Now, everyone, of course, that purchases a share probably has different expectations of what the future is. But really, when we talk about a marketplace and we talk about the whole point of a marketplace is that price is supposed to represent the consensus view of the future. And kind of a simple way of looking at this or an example that hopefully will resonate with a lot of people is that if we went back, you know, at this point, like 14, 15 months, and I use this example the other day, we go back and look at what expectations were around inflation and interest rates. Of course, the expectations were that inflation was, quote unquote, transitory, that interest rates would not rise. Um, and we heard that from all the central bankers, right? So directly from the horse's mouth saying interest rates were not going to go up. Well, that consensus view changed very quickly, and that had impacts on the market. And that's when we saw stuff get repriced. But really, when we're looking at the future, it's valuation levels and looking at the valuation levels of those underlying securities that are in there. Um, so I think that's a really good place to start. You're never going to know exactly what's priced into that. But certainly sitting there and looking at something like a price to earnings ratio, if it is extremely high, then you know a lot of growth is priced into that, right? Because remember, over time, particularly around emerging technologies, over time, those price to earnings ratios will tend to come back towards the market, right? So nothing's going to trade at 200 times earnings forever. And what people are making the bet on, of course, is that the earnings growth is so high that even as that price earnings ratio comes down, that it's still going to be a profitable investment for you because of that tremendous earnings growth. So that's really where we can start to look at valuation levels, and they can give us some clues into what people expect to happen. So hopefully that helped answer your question, Paul. All right, we're going to talk about ethical ETF. So I don't know if I'm allowed to do this, but I stole a screenshot. Stole is, I, I have a subscription, so I pay for it. Um, but I took a screenshot from the Wall Street Journal. Um, there's a column called Intelligent Investor uh, in there, which I think is really good. Um, and there's an article the other day talking about, and certainly more of an opinion piece, but that green funds, so ESG funds, cost three times more than you think. So first of all, let's talk a little bit about ESG, because this is another huge focus 
of investment companies. And there are a lot of characteristics, as I said before, around ESG that are similar to thematics. As I said, it's a way to broaden the product landscape in an already pretty filled product landscape, right? You know, when we're talking about over 400 ETFs in Australia, there's not a lot of spaces you can go. ESG has been a big one that a lot of companies have gone into. And of course, an ESG investment portfolio is looking at three different factors. So um, ethical, social, and environmental, social, and governance are the three different factors they're looking for. And really, this whole movement started a very long time ago and started with a lot of religious groups that did not want to invest in things that their religion did not believe in. Um, so that was kind of where this started. And of course, with climate change and the focus on sustainability, we've seen a lot of the focus on E, right, on those environmental factors and the way that this actually plays out. So many people think that, and there are some that do this, the issue is a wide, wide topic. The way it generally plays out is that companies will be removed from an index. And then, of course, by certain criteria that are in there. And then, of course, there will be an ETF that is based on that index. So you can see up here on this first point, these are U.S. stats, but Australia is following a similar path. But if we go back and we look at the five years before um, the end of 2022, a lot of money is flowing into ESG funds and a lot of money is coming out of all sorts of different so the idea here is that um, this is a bit of a play on people's social conscience and just the desire to improve the world and using their investment funds to do that. Um, certainly, Europe is far ahead of almost everyone else in terms of the mandates around ESG. We've seen big companies like BlackRock, which is one of the largest um, ETF issuers in the world, one of the largest fund managers in the world really, really focused on ESG, but there's been a bit of a backlash lately. Um, and the backlash is centered around a couple of different things. One, does this do any good um, is part of the backlash. I'm not going to spend too much time getting in that today. Um, but the other, uh, the other thing is, okay, well, what are you actually investing in? And sort of this exclusion area approach where we're just taking out certain companies, we saw a big argument involving Elon Musk, um, who of course makes every argument bigger around this when um, Standard & Poor's, which is one of the major index providers, removed Tesla from their ESG um, from their ESG portfolio. And they did that because they pointed out a lot of different issues with what Tesla was doing. He, of course, disagreed, focused more on the battery technology technology space. But I think ESG, many investors sort of reflexively invest in it because they think, oh, this is something good to invest in. I don't want to harm the world. Uh, but as you can see, a lot of funds are going into ESG. Why do fund companies like them? Because they charge more for ESG than they do for, uh, for other funds. But what in practice a lot of this is, is you see a lot of um, see a lot of oil, gas, coal, et cetera, companies like that pulled out of these ESG indexes. But, and a lot of that goes into technology and healthcare and industries that have smaller environmental footprints. But there is a lot of overlap still between some of these portfolios. And I think one of the important things about ESG, and particularly what happened last year with a lot of these ESG funds, is investors haven't really thought about what's actually in them. Um, so we're going to spend a second talking about that. And you can see this quote that I took from the article, um, that there is this Harvey's, uh, there's this Harvard study saying, yeah, 68% of their assets were invested in the exact same holdings as non-ESG funds. So there's a lot of overlap there. Um, and once again, these are not necessarily the way that a lot of these ETFs work and the indexes they track. They're not necessarily looking for companies that are doing anything positive for the world. They're kind of looking for companies that are doing less harm and just easily removing out those, uh, those companies. So you get a lot of technology, you get a lot of healthcare, but particularly if we're looking at U.S. and global markets, technology and healthcare make up a huge amount of those markets. And so it is just important to see that, uh, 
see those differences um, and how that plays out as an investor. So I took two examples. So I took this beta shares global sustainability leaders ETF, and I compared it to Vanguard Miski International ETF. So these are both global ETFs. One has this um, ESG filter, really, that's removing companies from it. And we take a look at these two different portfolios and see, uh, yeah, see how different they are. So you can see right here that in many cases, a lot of the country allocations are pretty similar, right? Close to 70% of assets in the U.S., for these, uh, for these global funds. And you'll see kind of the same countries on here with some slight variations between, uh, between the two. But once again, kind of dominated by the US. And right now it's like both of them, right? So ETHI, this beta shares product, it's a bronze rating, this Vanguard Misk International ETF gets a silver rating. Then of course we look at style and we look at size of company in there. Very, very similar, right? So they're investing in large growth and blend companies, primarily in the US. Um, so you can see very, very similar right there. So you're not really getting any difference in terms of style between value and growth or between large and small caps. Um, so a lot of similarities there as well. Then of course we have sectors, and this is where we start to see those differences. But it's important to think about sectors and it's important to understand this so you can understand how your ETF is going to perform in different environments. Because the last thing we wanna do is have a ignorant reaction to short-term underperformance. And then of course, switch into something else. Um, so what you'll see is some differences that we would expect a lot less in basic materials, right? So if we think about an Aussie um, ethical ETF, eliminating a lot of basic materials is eliminating a lot of the very big companies on the Australian exchange, right? So only 3.73% globally, Australia is much higher, right? So if we just sit there and look at BHP, which falls into basic materials, we're not even talking about Rio or Fortescue or anything else, um, you know, it makes up 10% of the Aussie market. So yeah, much smaller there, but you can, see a, uh, you can see a difference there. The other big one, of course, as we talked about was energy. So they completely exclude any energy companies. So started thinking all those big oil um, companies that are being uh, that are being removed there. And then we see a lot in industrials as well, um, which is not surprising little more than half the uh, half the allocation to that, or sorry, a little less than half the allocation. And then interestingly enough, in this consumer defensive space, we see a huge drop as well. And of course, where is that money going? Well, into healthcare, as I said, into technology, we've got more than 8% difference um, into, interestingly enough, financial services, which a lot of people do not consider ethical, um, but of course, do have lower carbon footprints than a uh, more old school industrial company or certainly a oil and gas supplier. Uh, so what we're seeing is a shift. Now that shift has worked very, very well. If we go back and we look at the last five years, and we'll talk about last year, um, but if we go back and look at the last five years, what has performed really well? U.S. technology, things of that nature have really outperformed, which is why we saw such strong performance out of U.S. markets, out of those individual sectors. And that's actually reflected in the, uh, in the performance. I'll go back to that slide in a second. And that's reflected in the performance. So I took two charts here. This is five years. So I compared these two. So you can see Vanguard, the non-ethical, non-ESG, um, I would say non-ethical, the non-ESG index up a very healthy 43%, but far outpaced by this ethical ETF. Then if we look at the last year, of course, where a lot of these technology companies where the US underperformed, a lot of these technology companies really underperformed. We saw this thing reverse a little bit, right? Um, where we had over 3% underperformance by that ethical ETF. So sorry, let me get to this last uh, slide and we'll talk about the important point of fees. You can see similar names on here. Um, you know, certainly, uh, certainly some differences. So this beta shares product is actually interesting because they actually weight by not market cap, 
which is the largest companies, which is how a lot of broad-based indexes are weighted. They actually weight by um, their ESG score, right? So the way that ESG generally works is there are companies, and Morningstar does this as well. We have part of our company called Sustainalytics that provides um, that provides these ratings um, as well. We rate companies on all sorts of different factors. So, you know, I think we're up to 65, 66 factors that every company is rated on across that ESG um, lens. And beta shares in this product, which I think is interesting, they actually weight their ETF based on those ESG scores. So Apple, which is still the biggest company in the world, um, we can see actually fell um, or their rating visa higher. So you can see similar companies in here. A couple of notable exceptions, of course, ExxonMobil is out, um, which, uh, which is sort of unsurprising given their, uh, given their business line. But you can see similar, um, similar names, but there certainly are differences. And that's really like to this, right? We saw last year, even though oil and gas, for example, that energy sector does make up a very small part of the overall index, did very well last year. We've seen that in Australia as well, right? With a lot of the oil stocks, coal stocks, as we've seen energy prices go up, we've seen them do very well. Certainly that isn't gonna be captured in an ESG index. But I think the important thing to look at is this total cost ratio, which is what you're paying. And you can see the difference here, right? You're certainly paying a lot more for this ESG index. So once again, obviously I'm not telling anyone what to do or what their values are, or how to invest, but some things to think about with ESG indexes is, all right, what are they excluding? Where are they overweight? How is that gonna impact returns in different environments? And then of course, is that fee actually worth it? Um, which is a important thing to look at as well. So, well, I wouldn't say that ESG meets that classic definition of a theme. Um, and there's certainly lots of climate change and other types of ETFs that try to kind of capture that pure theme. So ESG doesn't really meet those criteria, but certainly something, once again, where there are some things for investors to consider before they actually make those investments. All right, so I think I missed a couple of questions. Sorry for putting me on the big screen. Um, oh, that's not where I want to go. Uh, let's see, what did I miss here? If you have any more, just um, send them in. All right, so we've got a good question. How do we compare an ETF with bonds? Which one is safer compared to the other one? Um, yeah, so as Paul pointed out, I did talk about that last week very, very quickly, um, what the difference is between an ETF and a bond. So I assume you're talking about a bond ETF um, and not a uh, not an equity ETF, but very, very just quickly. So remember, that's a portfolio of bonds. Um, so it's very different as a different return um, profile than an individual bond, where if you remove credit risk from it, so assuming that whoever's bond you purchase is going to pay you back, you can see those bond ETFs decline over time if interest rates continue to go up. And the reason for that is, of course, those portfolios are being turned over. So as something matures, instead of you just getting your money back, what you're seeing in that ETF is you're, of course, seeing that replaced with a new bond. And there is an overall portfolio that will keep declining in value as interest rates go up, may keep declining in value as interest rates go up. So yeah, bonds are, once again, just a little bit of a nuance along with um, income that you do need to worry about when you're investing in ETFs. All right, a lot of questions which is exciting for me and probably for all of you as well. So anyway, thank you guys very much for joining. I appreciate it. If you have any questions, I still have a couple of emails to get back to from last Tuesday. Sorry about that. If you have any questions, shoot them through to mark.lamonica1 at morningstar.com. We've got two more ETF-related um, webinars coming up. 
next week, we are going to talk about that subject of income from ETFs. So I'll dive a little deeper into that and some pitfalls for trying to generate income from ETFs. And then we're going to go through and actually examine some ETFs. So we'll go in in detail and hopefully we'll teach you how to analyze them on your own. And we'll take a couple, I'll take a couple from that list of the 10 most popular ETFs. So anyway, thank you guys very much for joining. And yeah, I'll be back next week. Any advice in this video is general advice or regulated financial advice under New Zealand law prepared by Morningstar Australasia Proprietary Limited and or Morningstar Research Limited without reference to your financial objectives, situation or needs. You should consider the advice in light of these matters and any relevant product disclosure statement before making any decision to invest. To obtain advice for your own situation, contact a financial advisor.